In this video, I will be making minoxidil. Minoxidil is quite a unique compound, in that it is one of, if not the only compound that stimulates hair growth. Minoxidil's structure is also quite interesting, and relatively unique, as it contains the N-oxide group, that is rarely seen in medication. It also contains a whopping 5 amines in close proximity, so it almost looks like it could be an explosive. Minoxidil has seen rising popularity in both topical and oral forms for improving hair strength and looks. It is only indicated for head hair, but it is able to strengthen hair all over the body. Medically, it is used as an antihypertensive and vasodilator, but for that, it generally requires higher doses and seems to be not so common due to available alternatives. Minoxidil on its own is not capable of completely stopping or reversing androgenetic alopecia, aka patent hair loss, that causes receding hairlines in men and some women. This is because minoxidil only strengthens and improves the hair, through a yet unknown mechanism, while hair loss is due to the effect of dihydrotestosterone, aka DHT, on the hair follicles. To prevent pattern hair loss, the only working medications are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, such as finasteride or sometimes the stronger dutasteride. This medication prevents most of the conversion of testosterone to DHT, thereby preventing it from causing hair loss. It cannot bring back already lost hair which is why it is recommended to start early. If the dose is correct, there should be no side effects to the medication. The same holds for minoxidil. A tiny oral dose is enough to strengthen hair. Still, minoxidil is often used topically on the affected areas, but the penetration and bioavailability is poor and it leaves a residue. Also, minoxidil is extremely toxic to dogs and cats, and they can die if the applied area is licked or from residues on a pillow. These are reasons why oral administration is more convenient. I was curious how minoxidil could be made and I started with relatively simple chemicals which I happen to already have. There are multiple pathways but this one seems to be a bit more modern. But first a word from our sponsor for this video. Flexispot. Are you tired of your old back pain inducing chair? Does your chair not provide enough back support? I'm watching your favorite YouTuber and is it not fully adjustable? That means it's time to throw it out. Even the dog agrees and replace it with the ergonomic Flexispot C7 chair. I have been using it for about a month now and it is genuinely a good chair. Because I sit for a large part of the day, it is important to have a good chair to prevent any issues. Just like a bed. Do you want to cheap out on something you spend one third of your life in? Probably not the best idea. It even has a comfortable headrest for my big green head. Besides, I can fully adjust the armrest to any position I want so that my arms don't get tired. The foam and mesh fabric it's made of makes it very soft and breathable. But that's not the only thing. It has an optional footrest, so you can fully zone out in your chair and recover from inhaling all the chemical fumes. It is making the dog jealous. Of course, you can also adjust the height, the back support, and the lumbar support to your liking. And even the seat depth and tilt can be adjusted. If you want to get a new comfortable ergonomic chair, follow the link down below and you can use my exclusive code C730 to enjoy a $30 discount. Thanks to Flexispot for sponsoring this video. Now let's start with the synthesis. So we start off with some simple beaker chemistry. I set up a large beaker with a stir bar in which I add 500 ml of ethanol as a solvent and reagent. I react it with 32.5 grams of sodium metal, creating a solution of sodium ethoxide, which is a strong base while the formed hydrogen bubbles out. When it's done, it managed to become nearly black, for an unknown reason, but it shouldn't be an issue. I also added back ethanol to about the same volume as the start, as some of it boiled away. Half of this solution I will use now, and the rest for later. So I add half of it to another beaker, add a stir bar, and then 80 grams of the reagent ethyl cyanoacetate, which I happen to have sitting around for many years. And this is all I have left. It reacts quickly to form the sodium salt, by taking up an acidic alpha hydrogen, similar to deprotonation of melanates. I mix it around and the reaction should be complete. I set that aside and now take the other half of the sodium ethoxide solution. Into this, I add 68.6 grams of the reagent guanidine hydrochloride, simply to deprotonate it and get the free base guanidine. Sodium chloride precipitates from the solution and I now combine this solution with the other solution, while filtering out some of the sodium chloride through some cotton. However, it wasn't so successful. Either way, it shouldn't matter much if it stays around. When both solutions are fully combined, I heat it to a boil for two hours. In this reaction, 
ethyl cyanoacetate and guanidine react in the presence of a strong base, giving this 2,4-diamino-6-hydroxypyrimidine. How exactly it proceeds wasn't fully detailed online. However, based on the reagents and the end product, I can theorize a the path that it takes. Since we see the formation of the sodium salt of ethyl cyanoacetate, which creates a nucleophile, it is likely to assume it will act as one. Meanwhile, guanidine is quite difficult to deprotonate in comparison. In the product, we see that the carbon of the nitrile ends up inside the ring. This means it must be attacked by a nitrogen of guanidine to give this position. If we consider a deprotonated guanidine, it could attack the nitrile to give the following intermediate, but I would consider it unlikely to happen as all the ethyl cyanoacetate is already deprotonated and guanidine likely is not. Instead, the deprotonated ethyl cyanoacetate must act as a nucleophile and the only way forward is to attack the carbon of guanidine. This creates an intermediate where the nitrile would not end up inside the ring. So it must be that the remaining deprotonated amine attacks the nitrile intermolecularly. Meanwhile, the carbon-carbon bond moves to form a carbon-nitrogen double bond with another amine, and the alpha carbon takes up the remaining proton from that amine, giving this new intermediate where the nitrile carbon ends up inside the ring. This system can move its double bonds and protons around to whatever position in resonance. If we consider the deprotonated amine to be the terminal amine, it can cyclize by attacking the ester and kicking off ethoxide, giving back sodium ethoxide. This new intermediate can have aromaticity, and so will move quickly to do so, as it is the most stable. First, the amines will move their double bonds inside, and have the primary amines on the outside. Then, the remaining carbonyl can be protonated by the adjacent acidic alpha hydrogen, moving the carbon-hydrogen bond electrons into the ring to form a double bond, while a pair of the carbonyl double bond electrons moved onto the protonated carbonyl, giving a hydroxyl and completing aromaticity, giving this stable pyrimidine. When that's done, I immediately concentrate it to as little volume as possible by boiling it open to the air. When that's done, I destroy all the remaining sodium ethoxide by adding water. I then react away the formed sodium hydroxide by adding acetic acid, giving only a slightly acidic solution. I then leave this to stir while hot, to dissolve the solids. Whatever didn't dissolve, I filtered out by using a cotton plug, and filtered it into a large crystallizing dish to allow it to cool down and crystallize. When it has cooled, a bunch of solid has crystallized out that should be mostly the product. I filter part of it to remove most of the liquid and then return all the solid back to the crystallizing dish to do another crystallization, because it looks very dirty. So I dissolve it all back into boiling water and then filter it through a paper filter to again remove insoluble material. I then allow it to cool down and crystallize again in another dish. It now looks better and I filter it again to collect the solid. The solid is still very wet, but the compound is very stable, so I can just heat it to above 100 C to dry it out completely. After a while, it became dry and I crushed it all between my fingers. In the end, I am left with 28.2 grams of what seems to be a slightly impure product, which is a yield of 31% and a lot worse than literature. I blame the beakers and the dirty sodium ethoxide. Either way, I can continue with this to the next step. So I have transferred all the material to a flask in a heating mantle, and I add 40 ml of phosphoryl chloride directly on top. In literature they used more than 200 ml, but I'm not going to use and waste so much for this, so this will have to do. I then heat this to reflux temperature and allow it to react for a few hours. In this reaction, phosphoryl chloride reacts with the hydroxyl of the pyrimidine to give the chlorinated derivative. It proceeds first through nucleophilic attack of the hydroxyl onto phosphoryl chloride, giving this intermediate and hydrogen chloride. How exactly it proceeds further is said to go through multiple complex intermediates and it seems the reaction mechanism for this specifically isn't known. Either way, it will just give the chlorinated product. When I come back, it looks like tar and it is hopefully finished. So to destroy excess phosphoryl chloride, I add a bunch of water. And then stir it until everything redissolves, and then bring the pH to 8 
with a sodium hydroxide solution and also some solid sodium hydroxide. Otherwise, the product might be protonated and stay in the water phase. When that's done, I can add ethyl acetate as the extraction solvent to get out the product. Since the water is still hot, it will also help to cool it down by boiling part of the solvent away. I move the mixture to a separatory funnel and then separate the bottom water layer from the top ethyl acetate layer. I collect the ethyl acetate layer and then return the water layer to the funnel again to extract it once more with ethyl acetate. I am then left with the ethyl acetate extract that contains some watery junk that is difficult to separate. So to absorb that, I add a large amount of the drying agent sodium sulfate, which will absorb the water and hold on to the crab. When it looks good, I filter this through some cotton directly into a flask to remove the sodium sulfate again, giving a transparent yellow solution that contains the product. I set it up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvent, giving the product as a light yellow solid. I move all of it to a dish and the yield turned out to be 16.2 grams, which is 50% compared to the 85% in literature. Since I used a lot less phosphoric chloride, it is to be expected and maybe the starting material wasn't of the best quality either. This molecule is also commercially available for way cheaper than what I used to make it, which is why I didn't want to spend too much phosphoric chloride on it, but I still wanted to do these steps and see what they are like. Now moving on to the next step, I add half of the chloropyrimidine product to a large flask and I mix it with 60 ml of ethanol as a solvent. I then weighed out 12.2 grams of m chloropyrimidoic acid and I dissolve it all in 50 ml of ethanol. I add it slowly to the solution in the flask and it gradually turns transparent. I then let it stir at room temperature for an hour. In this reaction, m chloropyrimidoic acid oxidizes the pyrimidine nitrogen between the two primary amines to give an N oxide. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the pyrimidine nitrogen onto the peroxy acid, picking up an hydroxyl. This is subsequently deprotonated by the formed benzoate to give the N oxide. The two adjacent amines have a stabilizing effect on the N oxide, which is why it prioritizes this nitrogen and also makes it less likely to happen again on the other nitrogen. When it's finished, it is cloudy and I make sure to convert the formed chlorobenzoic acid to its sodium salt form by adding 22 ml of an aqueous 6 molar sodium hydroxide solution. It then turns transparent again and I set it up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvents. I then add back a small amount of ethanol to stir it loose and wash the solid with. I filter this with vacuum filtration through a filter paper and I washed it twice more with some ethanol. I am then left with a yellow solid. It is still slightly wet so it gives a weight of 10.9 grams and a yield of 123%. It doesn't have to be completely dry so the real yield will remain unknown. I forward all of the material to the final reaction where I make my noxidil. To the material, I add an excess of the base and reagent piperidine, around 50 ml. I then attach a condenser and heat it to a reflux, and I leave that overnight. In this reaction, piperidine reacts with the chloropyrimidine to give monoxidil. In this case, the reaction only proceeds at reflux temperatures and a fair amount of time after we have done the anoxidation. If we would try this before the anoxidation, it would fail, as the heterocycle would be too deactivated. How it proceeds? is first through nucleophilic attack of piperidine onto the carbon adjacent to the chlorine, pushing a pair of carbon-nitrogen bond electrons onto the nitrogen. It quickly reforms the double bond to restore aromaticity and instead kicks off the chlorine as it is a better leaving group. This gives a protonated minoxidil intermediate that is deprotonated by another piperidine molecule, giving piperidine hydrochloride and minoxidil as the final product. When I return, it looks pretty much the same and I set it in an ice water bath to cool it down. I then filter all of it with vacuum filtration to collect the precipitated monoxidil, and I wash it once with some piperidine. After letting it dry on the filter with vacuum for a good while, I move it to a dish, and the yield of not yet pure monoxidil turned out to be 4.25 grams, or 30%. This is notably different from the 100% yield in the patent, but usually they lie in patents. The material isn't fully pure yet, and we can clean it up by moving it all to a flask and reflux it in a 50-50 mixture of isopropanol and water. After that, it should be cleaner 
and a lot of the yellow has moved into the solvent. I let it cool down to room temperature and some more product crystallizes out. I filter it all through a filter paper and again let it dry on the filter for a good while. I move it all to a small dish again and heated it to about 60 C to drive off more of the solvent. It deflates a lot and the weight after purification is 2.3 grams, which is 54% of the original. Now to see if it is really minoxidil, I can simply compare it to commercial minoxidil in topical hair growth sprays, which should just contain minoxidil together with the solvents ethanol and propylene glycol. To compare them, I can just use thin layer chromatography, or TLC for short, which will separate components based on their polarity and show me if there is a compound with similar polarity in here which must be minoxidil. The size of the spots are different because I didn't put on the same amount on the plate. Also, because the standard contains some of the solvent propylene glycol, which barely evaporates from the plate, it causes an increase in polarity for this lane only and pushes the spots further up. So it's clear that it helped the standard spot travel slightly farther. Either way, the position of the spot matches the travel distance in literature, which is why I used this specific eluent. And it is also similar enough to the standard. So it's an easy and cheap method to pretty much verify that I have monoxidil. That was it. See ya.